Hello everyone, I hope we're all having a wonderful day. Okay, in this session today, I'm going to be going to be talking about congressional elections. Um, I will very quickly go over the work I set you on congressional trends, looking at incumbency, coattails, etc, etc. And then the main focus of today's lesson will be on the midterm elections. So without further ado, let's very quickly go over um, the factors which affect congressional elections. These are the ones um, obviously to Congress, the House and the Senate. Um, and again, these different factors could each be a paragraph currently in an essay. And again, I can quite easily see a question like evaluate the view that incumbency is the most significant trend in congressional election outcomes or something of that nature. So have a look at these then. So firstly, we've got incumbency and what you should have found from news in the Bennett book it, there's a very high chance of re-election of US members of Congress, the Senate and the House. Uh, again, if you look in the book, it gives you the figures. It's way over 90% of House members get re-elected. Um, it's something like 85% or something of senators get re-elected. So if you're a sitting member of the House or a sitting senator, the chances are if you want to be re-elected, then you will get re-elected. There's a small number who lose in primes every year. And there's a number who lose in the election, but it's quite small. Usually there's quite a big um, incumbency advantage. And again, a lot of it's for the same reason as for presidential candidates, why they always get re-elected. It's because they're well known in their district. They've brought home the bacon, as they call it. They've brought things to their districts. Uh, you know, they've had roads repaved and all that kind of stuff. And they've usually raised money as well. And included in this, of course, is that many seats, well, many, a number of seats in the House of Representatives are gerrymandered. What that means is the parties which control the states, so say the Republicans control, I don't know, North Carolina, for example, uh, what they will do when they're drawing up the congressional boundaries, the constituencies, after a census, they will try to make sure they have as many safe Republican districts as possible. And so, again, what this creates is an incumbency advantage because, you know, opposition parties don't have much chance of winning in those particular areas. And again, uh, you should have seen in the book there were some examples of districts which were gerrymandered. OK, there's the coattail effect. So, again, this only happens when there's a presidential election of the same year. But this is the idea that a president who's running for office uh, brings like a surge of supporters uh, for him, and while they're in the ballot box, you know, the ballot, the polling station even, uh, people might well vote for their congressional person as well. So if, for example, Trump or Biden was particularly popular somewhere, and they, you know, lots of their supporters come and vote on that day, whilst they're voting for Trump or Biden, they might well vote for Democrat or Republican um, for the House and the Senate at the same time. And they call that the coattail effect. Again, you can see uh, from the diagram, I think it was in a previous video actually, um, how this has actually declined in recent years. Okay, split ticket voting as well. This is the idea that people used to, um, has declined a lot, uh, may give one vote to the Democrat and one vote to the Republican. So you might get someone who says, I really love Donald Trump, I'm voting for Trump for president, but I really love my Democrat congressman, so I'm going to vote Democrat for congressman. This has been in real big decline. Um, and these days, you know, there's very few areas, I would say, where there's real strong split ticket voting. There's not many states which vote Democrat, have a Democrat senator. Um, and I think there'll be even fewer after the election this year. Um, and there were not that many, they call them Clinton, Trump cost constituencies or vice versa. And then finally, fewer competitive districts. Oh, this fits into that gerrymandering point, really. Um, there's lots of safe areas. This year, I noticed that in the Senate for the election to Arkansas, the Democrats haven't even put a candidate up. So if you're a Democrat in Arkansas and you want to vote Democrat for the Senate, then you can't because there's no candidate. And every year there's a, there's a couple of House seats uh, where there's no Democrat or Republican stands uh, because they're so safe for one party over the other. OK, then, so I hope that's all clear. And what I want to really focus on today are the midterm elections. So I shall put the graph up and I'll explain what these are. So just very quickly before we do midterms, I found this little map which shows uncontested congressional districts in 2018. So blue is where there's no Democrats stood, red is where no Republicans stood. And you can see there were 38 districts where no Republicans stood and three where there were no uh, Democrats that stood. 
OK, the midterms then. So these are the elections which take place midway through a presidential term. As we know, members of Congress, House members are elected every two years. The president is elected every four years. So obviously in that four year term in the middle, there is a congressional election where all the House members are up for election and a third of the US Senate. Now, these elections have certain trends. OK. And the clearest trend is going to be shown on the next slide or two. Let me find it. Here it is. This is the trend in midterm elections. So you've got a picture of the president whose midterm it was within. And you can see from this table or this graph how midterm elections are normally not very good for the incumbent president. Uh, if you look on there, there's very few examples of a president's party winning any seats in those midterm elections. If I, by the way, was to make this for Donald Trump as well, I need to put him on at the end. Um, the light blue colour, by the way, are House seats and the dark colour are Republican. Um, so the dark colours are Senate seats. If I was to do this for 2018 midterm elections, this is the one under Trump, uh, the Democrats picked up, um, well, the Republicans lost 42 seats. The Democrats picked up 41 of them. So the blue line would go down here. So the red line, if you get this right, Paul, would go down here. So in terms of the House, the Republicans had the, the worst night they've had since 1974, after the Watergate crisis. In terms of the Senate, though, the Republicans actually, I think they picked up a seat, or was it dead even? It might have been dead even. Anyway, they didn't lose particularly any seats in this. I think, actually, I think they picked up two. So, um, so 2018 fits into the pattern of the presidential party losing seats. Now, there's been a few occasions where that hasn't happened. So JFK, 1962, you see here, this midterm took place two weeks after the Cuban Missile Crisis. So President um, Kennedy had basically saved America from being you know, annihilated in a nuclear war, and he still lost some House members. But at least it did gain a couple of Senate seats. Um, the next two was Bill Clinton in 1998. In his second midterm, he actually picked up a couple of House seats. This was after the Monica Lewinsky affair and impeachment. Um, and then George W. Bush in 2002. This was after 9-11, uh, uh, when he and this party were very, very popular. But they are literally only a few occasions. I suppose you've got uh, FDR in 1934 as well where the incumbent president always loses seats. So if the Democrats were to win the election in 2020, then they could probably f they're probably going to look forward to losing seats um, in the 2022 election. And there's a couple of reasons people put forward for this. One is, is that are the midterm elections really a referendum on the president? So obviously Obama in 2010 was not particularly popular following Obamacare and stuff, and therefore... Uh, the voters wish to punish him by punishing his party in those midterm elections and give a strong message to Obama, we don't like what you're doing, change your ways. If so, that didn't then dis transpire in the election for president because he actually won it by the same amount he won in 2008. And that is something else true for these, by the way. Often these great big defeats like Bill Clinton in 94 doesn't necessarily mean the president's going to lose the election himself two years later. But anyway, it can often be seen as a referendum on the president. Um, another issue you sometimes get with the midterms is um, who turns out to vote. So very often in the midterms, you'll find that the president's party supporters are a bit less keen to turn out to vote than they are in the general election. And this also tends to hurt the Democrats more as well. You know, minorities, poorer people, young people, they're not the best ones for voting anyway and particularly so in midterm elections. They'll, they'll often drag themselves out for the presidential election if they have to, but they're a bit less keen in those midterms, whereas Republicans tend to be a bit keener to vote, uh, generally speaking, anyway. So these are the trends you often see from midterms, and you often hear arguments about it being a referendum on the presidency, um, you know, as a, a thing for that. Although it very rarely then results, you know, reflects the result of the presidential election two years later. Now, often in the midterms, the president is not often welcome to campaign in those elections because obviously they're not seen as a bit of a drag on the ticket and candidates like to show 
that they are not the same as the president. They're someone different. Um, this little video, this little news report kind of goes through the 2014 midterm, so Obama's second midterm elections, and it kind of shows the tricky situation presidents often face in midterm elections. So here goes. Weeks from today, one veteran politician noticeably absent from the campaign trail is the head of the Democratic Party, President Obama. He didn't attend any campaign rally until just this past Sunday. Here's Chief White House correspondent Major Garrett. President Obama is not on the ballot this November, but to the dismay of some Democrats, he's talking like he is. A lot of the states uh, that are contested this time are states that I didn't win. The bottom line is, though, these are all folks who vote with me. They have supported my agenda in Congress. The comments on Al Sharpton's radio show came as Democrats in competitive races try to distance themselves from the president. His 42% approval rating nationally is even lower in Republican-leaning states that will decide control of the U.S. Senate, like Kentucky, where Senate candidate Allison Lundergan Grimes has appeared with former President Bill Clinton, but won't even say if she voted for Mr. Obama. Every Kentuckian has the right for privacy at the ballot box. Give it up for Anthony Brown, your next governor! Even candidates who invite Mr. Obama, like Maryland's Democratic nominee for Governor Anthony Brown, reserve their TV ads for that other Democratic president. And you must have a leader. That's what Anthony Brown is. How are you? The Obama phenomenon attracted adoring crowds and Democratic candidates galore in 2006, 2008, and as president in 2010 and 2012, but not anymore. So far this cycle, the president has headlined just two rallies and 61 fundraisers. At this point in 2010, another tough midterm election, he had attended seven rallies and 60 fundraisers and would go on to lead 17 rallies and 69 fundraisers before Election Day. The president will attend five more rallies before Election Day, but none in... OK, so you get the general picture there. Sometimes what you find for the Senate is the third who are up for the election might be a bit more conservative than normal or a bit more Democrat than normal. So in 2018, the Democrats didn't really pick up that many. Well, they actually lost some seats in the Senate. But the seats they lost were in very Trump kind of leaning uh, uh, states like, for example, um, North Dakota and Missouri and Indiana. So sometimes it can work out that way. Uh, for them. But you see the general results here from the midterms uh, and you see some of the general patterns. Now what I'd like to do is that you need to get some details down about the last midterm elections and again if you look in the um, it's on the Larry Sabato um, extract on Teams there are some questions in your work booklet um, about the midterms from him. And again if you get a general question about congressional elections Again, do talk about midterms um, as the theme being the president often loses those particular elections. Um, again, you need examples, and I'll do another video in a few minutes, but I'll do one with lots of adverts on from 2018, and I'll show you a couple of the races that took place. So again, you can use those examples to use in your um, essays. But again, incumbents often win, even during midterms. Not as high as normal, but they do incumbents do have a high chance of winning. So... Again, that particular kind of theme does continue.